and teaching. And so I'd ask you now if you would open your Bibles to, as you guessed, the book of 1 John. And, and to, today we're going to be going through the first four verses. And again, our theme is no. And John, I believe, uh, gives us some evidences. Really, I can take these evidences and ask a question. And if we answer that question, if we can't answer that question, it's evidence that we are indeed a child of God, that we are indeed a genuine follower of Christ. And so I want to pose that question to you first, and then I want to read this passage. The question that I want you to be thinking about today is this. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Let me say a couple statements about that and then we'll read the verses. I believe there are a lot of people who know about God. A lot of people can talk theology. Theology is talk, discussion about God. You can knock on any door and, and hear somebody's ideas and thoughts about God. Knowing about God is much different than knowing God personally. That is is what John, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, fires out to us right out of the gate in this book. The question again, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Let's read the first four verses. The word of life, that which was from the beginning... Jesus was at the beginning, was there in the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon with our hands, our hands have handled of this word of life, this Jesus. For the life, Jesus' life was manifested, was made real. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. That is powerful and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, able to pierce and convict and, and touch. And, and Lord, one of the things that I love about your word is it is light. And so light exposes darkness, exposes false un, unrealities, not factual things. I'm so thankful for your word that it is light. Expose in our lives, Lord, what may be amiss. And I pray that if there's anybody in this service this morning that, that doesn't have a personal relationship with you, that you will expose that this morning for what it is, and that your spirit would convict and draw and move in such a way that maybe somebody this morning would turn their lives over and surrender their lives to you through repentance and just living life the way you call them to live it, a life of faith. And so bless our time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things that I love to do as we start off is, is uh, for those that, that know me best, know that, that my preaching can often come off, come off as teaching. And I just think that we're living in a day where a lot of people try to just kind of make the Bible fit into their life. Well, I mean, let me pick this verse out and this verse out and, and make it say what I want it to say. I, I, I'm opposite of that. I make my life fit into the Bible. So what the Bible says is the ultimate authority ultimate truth in my life and I as a child of God want to line my life up with that and so because of that as a preacher I choose to let the text do the talking amen 
and, and be very weary of preachers and teachers who, who aren't letting the text do the talking. Because the text, we believe as Christians, is the very holy words penned by men through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God's book to you and God's book to me. And so, let's look at these first four verses and see what they are saying to us. Look in, in uh, verses 1 and 2. What I see here in verses 1 and 2 is John, John basically just saying, Listen, folks, I know this Jesus. I know him personally. Uh, remember last week, we talked about why some of the other background reasons for John writing this book. One of them was to expose all of the false junk going out there about this man Jesus. There were people that saying, well, he was just completely man. He wasn't God. He was completely man. There were others that were, that were going around saying, well, no, he was actually not a man at all. He was just a spirit that, that we were able to see. And then there were still others that were saying, no, actually, so he was a man all the way up until he was baptized, and then the Spirit of God came down, and once the Spirit of God came down, the Spirit and dwelled Jesus then, and then right before he died, the Spirit left him. And so kind of this combination of at one time he was all man, at one time he was all God, then he was all man again. And John's like, you guys are ridiculous. You don't even know what you're talking about. And what he's saying, look in verse 1, that from which is what at the beginning, so he's saying, listen, this God, Jesus, was, has always existed. The Jesus that I saw and knew and walked with and talked was, was God in human form. But Jesus existed from the very beginning of time. You know what John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1 says? Anybody here? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God, right? You know what the Word is? Jesus. Look up the Word, what that Word means. He's saying, in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And so, in this first verse, he's saying, this man, Jesus, this God-man, Jesus, who was there at the beginning, listen to this, folks. He's saying, I, we have heard him. I heard his audible voice. The physical man, Jesus, the humanity of Jesus could speak. I heard his teaching. I was there. I had conversations with him. That's not enough. I, I've seen him with my own eyes. I, I, he wasn't a spirit. He was a God-man. He was fully human yet fully God is what he's saying here. And we've seen him with our own eyes and we have looked upon. That, that word, I think the better word to use there is he's, we've gazed upon him. Uh, just, I, I mean, I, I, I could see John as he's writing this, he's saying, like, this man, Jesus, like, I was so taken and captivated by his ministry that there were times that I was just like, that was, that was a couple loaves of bread and a couple fish. There's 5,000 there's 5, people that just got fed. He's gazed upon this man, Jesus, and... And he's like, you guys don't have a clue what you're saying when you're making up all this junk and false stuff about him. I've heard him. I've seen him. And then I've like been in awe of him and gazed upon him. And then he said, and our hands have handled the word of life. My, my hands have touched Jesus. I, I, I've held hands with him. We've prayed together. I, I've touched this. He... If he's just spirit, you can't touch just spirit. I've handled him. And so, so he's, he's talking here about this relationship, this physical relationship, friendship, uh, mentorship that he had with Jesus. And then look in verse 2. He's like, I'm, I'm just going to kind of summarize this for you. This God-man was manifested to us. So he's saying... God made himself real to us. He, he made himself real to us. He manifested himself through Jesus. The man Jesus. 
That's who God is. You want to you know who God is? Look at the life of Jesus. God manifested himself through this physical Jesus, this human Jesus. I love that. And, and he's saying, and we saw him manifested, and we bear witness and show unto you this eternal life, which is Jesus, who was with the Father and was manifested to us. I thought of that word manifested, and I thought, you know, that's what we're after. On Sunday mornings, on Wednesday nights, on Sunday nights, our desire is that God's manifested presence would show up in our church. And, and while some of you are like, wait a minute, are you saying that we're going to see God? No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is there have been services that I've been a part of, and I hope that you have been a part of, when you walked out of the doors of the church, hopefully this one, you walk out and you say, the presence of God was in that place this morning. And you see, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, sometimes you miss that. You're not looking for that. You're not, you're not seeking that. And, and that's what John is saying. He's, saying, he's just saying, listen, this, this, all these ideas that you have about this man Jesus, I'm just telling you, I had a personal relationship with him. He walked with me, and he talked with me. And he showed me that I am his own. Now look in uh, verse 3. I think what John is saying here is, now after he said, hey, you know, I, 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 I had a personal relationship with Jesus. I think in, in verse 3 he's saying this. All genuine believers should have a personal relationship with Jesus. Look at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, speaking of Jesus, that so we've seen him and we've heard, we declare to you this, that you can have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, those of you that know me and hopefully love me know that I'm getting ready to ask a question. Does anybody know the Greek word for fellowship? This is a very popular word. A lot of people know this word. Let's see how well you do. It's a Greek word for fellowship. Starts with a K. Koinonia. I knew there'd be some folks in here that knew it. Koinonia. That word koinonia is, is when you see fellowship, the Greek word is koinonia. What that word means is, is, that, is that you're a partaker. You, you have something very deep in common with somebody. You're, you're in fellowship with them. You partake with them. From an earthly standpoint, from a physical standpoint, I, I think of a, a friend of mine, many, I'd say maybe five, six years ago, a dear friend of mine who was a mentor of mine growing up, she passed away from cancer. She was kind of a, a big sister, and, and her husband is a big brother, still are to this day. And, and I remember when she got the news that, that she had... The C word, cancer. And her diagnosis wasn't very good. Said that she had stage four and basically needed a miracle. And I tell you, at that moment, her name was Cindy. Cindy got cancer. But it wasn't Cindy that got cancer, just Cindy. My dear friend, Tony, her husband, while he didn't physically have cancer, Cindy had cancer, he was going through cancer too. And they had three daughters. Three daughters. They didn't physically have cancer, but the fellowship that they shared together, they went through cancer too. And that becomes real to us this morning as there are some who are battling health issues, some who are battling cancer, and you understand this word koinonia a little bit better now. Larry and Donna understand this. Tammy understands this. One person hurts, we all hurt. One person cries, we all cry. One person struggles, we're all struggling. 
One person rejoices, we're all rejoicing. That's what this word koinonia has. That's, that's kind of a, a, a real life application. And, and John is saying, listen, if you really knew this Jesus, you would have koinonia with us and you would have koinonia with Jesus. You would have a relationship with us and a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, he's, he's died on the cross, but guess what? He arose, and he is alive, and his spirit is moving and dwelling and can live in your heart. That's what John is saying. And he's saying you can have fellowship with him. You can know him. And guess what? When Jesus lived on this earth, he was holy. Guess what? Got news for you. I am a, part a partaker of his holiness. Now, what's that mean? Well, my position, if I ask Christ into my heart, my position at that moment is called, I'm justified. Meaning my position is I am perfect. As God sees me, he sees a perfect, sinless person because of the blood of Jesus. So my position is holy, but guess what? That doesn't end there. Because of what Christ did for me, there's something that changes me from the inside out, and I don't want to remain in sin anymore, which we'll get to in the days ahead in this book. And so I desire to live out my holiness. I, I desire for my position, my justification, to actually match my walk, right? So while I am holy by position, my whole life is going to be a struggle to match that up in a practical way to look like my position before God. But it's still my desire. I want to live my life to please God. And so that happens and we're challenged by that through a personal relationship with Christ. And that's what, that is what John is saying here. You have fellowship with him. You're a partaker of his holiness. Thank God you're a partaker of his grace. You're a partaker of his mercy. You're a partaker of his mission. Go and make disciples. That affects not just the pastor of this church. That affects every Christ follower you're a partaker of that that's God's mission for you but that will only be realized if you have a personal relationship with Christ you'll be challenged and convicted in those areas and 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 worship him for those things I love that and so so he's saying you can have koinonia with Jesus you can have a relationship with him if you are a genuine follower, you will, he says. Now, I love verse 4, and these things we write unto you so that your joy may be full. I think what I like to say here is, is, is John is saying, listen, I have a personal relationship with Jesus, verses 1 and 2. You, if you're a genuine believer, should have a personal relationship with Jesus, verse 3. And then verse 4, and that ultimately leads to fullness of joy. And if you are lacking joy in your life this morning, first place that you ought to look is deep into your own soul and heart. Do I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Don't ask your wife. Don't ask your husband. Can't live off your grandma's faith. Can't live off your grandpa's faith. Can't live off your aunt or uncle's or best friend's faith. You and I must have our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when that happens, joy is abounding. Circumstances are still tough. But in the midst of a difficult circumstance, that joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8.10, will be your strength. And so... Now comes the fun part for me is, what, what are these, okay, that's, that's what John is saying to the folks during that time. We believe this was written right at the end of uh, maybe A.D. 95-ish, somewhere around there, A.D. 100. So he obviously wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for the people then, but it also transcends time, God's Word does, and applies to us too, right? And so, so how does that affect me today? Well, first thing is simple. It's not real rocket science as a pastor. First question I would ask you this, and, and applying this to your life, is, is this question. Do you know that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you walking with Jesus? 
Are you, are you having fellowship with Jesus? Application number one this morning is this. Trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior and begin walking with Him. Have a relationship with Him. What does that look like, Mark? You might ask. Well, simply it just, it's, it's me saying I want to do things your way, God. It's me asking God to help me. It's, 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 it's me depending upon the, God, the Lord. It's, it's me seeking the Lord. And, and, and as you do your part, James chapter 4 verse 8 says, God draws nearer to you. And so that personal relationship becomes even more real to you. And so the first thing that I would say is, what's this mean for me today is, is this. Well, ask yourself the question of the morning. Do you truly and genuinely have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Second thing I would say is this. I know, being a pastor for many years now, that a question arises often. And the question that arises often is this one. Why do I feel so distant from God? Now let's be honest. Let's show of hands. Who, who here has said at one point in their walk with God that they just feel like God was distant? Anybody? Almost every hand. Now, I, I remember as I was a youth pastor, there were some kids that, that would say, I, I just don't get it. Like, I don't ever feel close to God. I feel like he's distant. And, and, and so, so I, 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 wanna, I want you to, to think about this. What is it that causes us to feel distance in our walk with God, in our relationship with God? Why, why is it? I think there's a lot of reasons. Let me, let me just list a few. Maybe you're not saved. Maybe you, you really don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, as James 4, 8 says, as I draw near to him, he will draw near to me. Maybe you don't have a personal walk with him. Maybe you know about God and you can talk about God better than anybody. But to make that application get from your head to your heart has never happened. This church has heard me say this often. Some people miss heaven by 18 inches. They know all about God but they don't know him personally. The book of James, as you can tell, I've memorized this book. I quote from it often. James says, you believe in God? Even the demons believe and shudder. Folks, it's more than knowing about God. It's having a personal walk with God. And so, so maybe you're not saved. Maybe that's why you feel distant. Psalm 66, verse 18 says this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear my prayers. If I regard sin, let me, let me break that down into Mark Glenn terms. If I love sin and I practice sin on purpose, I practice sin, I know it's wrong, but I'm still going to do it. God will not hear my prayers. And folks, if you've ever been to that place, when you're in your own quiet time with God in prayer, and you feel distance, you feel like there's no breakthrough, you feel like there's some disconnect, I'm not telling you that every time it's because you're regarding sin or cherishing sin in your life, but that's where I would go. God, maybe there is some hidden sin in my life. Maybe there's a sin that, that uh, Psalm, 19, Psalm 19 says that it's a presumptuous sin in my life. Will you forgive me for it? Because he will not hear my prayers if I cherish sin, if I practice sin. Now, if God isn't hearing me talk, are you going to feel close to him? Are you? No. If you don't feel like you're... Raise your hand if you've ever been in prayer and you would say, that was breakthrough prayer. Like, I broke through to God. God heard me. I know There was something different. Breakthrough prayer. Raise your hand. That's... That's, that's what we're after when we pray is, is, is that closeness, that breakthrough prayer, right? That breakthrough prayer. And if you're not experiencing that, that's, 
I would go there in my, in my cherishing sin in my life. So maybe you're not saved if you feel distance. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you're living in sin. Maybe, maybe I'm spending too much time busying myself. Maybe I, I don't have enough time to spend with God. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking and, and planning to, to uh, make an application on this point. If you're married and you're sitting in this room this morning and you kind of have a feeling that you're, you and your spouse are, while you're living together, you, you're almost not even like living together. Does that make sense? Has anybody else's spouse ever told him that? <laughs> I feel like we live together, but I don't know you. You're, you're doing your own thing. I'm doing my own thing. The kids are doing this and that. And, and, and that, is, that is so true in our lives as husbands and wives. And if you're newlyweds in here or been, been married for not a very long time, I'll just tell you, your wife wants you to have a uh, shorten that distance. And, and be close, and talk, and laugh, right? But maybe you aren't spending enough time with God. Maybe that's why there's a distance that you're feeling. Is you, want, you want to feel God's presence. You want to feel the Lord's presence in your life. You want to have that personal relationship, but, but there's, there's no talking to God. There's no getting into God's Word. Man, busyness can absolutely keep us from experiencing a personal relationship with God, a close personal relationship with Jesus. I'm too busy. I've seen this often. Why do I feel distance from God? Why, why does it feel like God is like just so far away? Why, he, I don't even think that, that He knows what I'm doing or what I'm thinking or the struggles that I'm having. One thing that has, has jumped out to me more than anything in that situation for folks is this. Is, is, is that we have a 2020 faith. 2020 vision. Meaning, oh, there are a lot of Christians out there who will trust God right up to the point that they understand what God's up to. As long as I can see where God's going here, as long as I can see what the outcome is, as long as I can know why I'm going through this, I'll trust Him. But at that moment where we don't understand what God is up to, we stop trusting God. Folks, that creates a wide gap in my relationship with God when I don't trust Him. And there comes a time in all of our lives where you will face and I will face days of uncertainty, of wondering where and why and what and how and when and whatever it may be. And God allows those trials into our lives for this reason, I believe. Shocker, I'm going to James. He says... Consider a joy when you encounter trials of various kinds, for we know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, produces a stronger faith muscle. God, I don't understand. I don't know what you're up to, but I'm still going to trust you. I'm still going to walk with you. I'm still going to follow you. I'm still going to do what you tell me to do. I'm still going to make disciples that will shorten that gap and that distance trusting and leaning into Jesus so why would you feel distant from God or I maybe it's because I'm not saved maybe it's because there's sin maybe it's because I'm too busy and not spending enough time with God maybe it's because I'm not trusting maybe that was a word for you all right, Mark, that's me. That's me, I feel distant. What can I, well, is there anything I can do? And in closing, I want to share with you just four points. If you're feeling distance from God, if you don't feel like you have a close personal relationship with God, 
with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, anybody, anybody in my mind here, it's not rocket science. First thing you want to do is make sure you're saved. Get saved. Get saved. Stop relying on your own mental abilities. You don't have to throw your brains in the trash can to believe that Jesus died for your sins. There's a great defense. Yes, this world is tough and it's hard and junk happens. And that's going to happen to me and I'm a pastor. And it's going to happen to you. That's called the consequences of this world's sin. is heartache and heartbreak. But I still know that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died for my sins. And he is living in my heart. And I'm going to accept that. He wants to have a relationship with me and I'm going to get saved. I know that there's someone in here this morning that doesn't have a personal walk with God. And I would challenge you right now. Humble yourself. The Spirit of God works in such a way that, that there's conviction. There's a little bit of anxiety. Give in to that. And trust Christ as your Savior. And get saved. Get saved. How do I get close to God? Get saved. Secondly, it's not rocket science here. Go, go deeper in your prayer time and your Bible study time. Now, I, I'm going to give you a real life example of this in my own life. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Real life example of this. This, this happened to me. So I'm, I'm reading in my own personal Bible study time. Just, I, I have my own time where, where I'm not studying for a message. It's just I want God to speak to me. And so that's why I get into God's Word. God, encourage me today with your Word. or Show me something in your Word. Or just, just get me excited. And so I'm reading through the books of, book of Acts. And I come to Acts chapter 4. And, and I'm reading about uh, Peter and John. And they were arrested and... They were doing great things in the name of the Lord, healing people and, and preaching, and people were getting saved. And then the, the religious folks of that day says, "Huh, uh you're doing that on your terms, not our terms. You're going to jail. And so they're in jail, and I'm reading all of this, and I put myself into the, the story. I like to do that, you know, in the storyline. Story I like to just try to feel what they feel and go through what they're going through. And I get to verse... 13, and they're being questioned, and they're asked all these questions. In verse 13, again, this is just my personal time with God, and I read this. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived, perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, they just began to marvel. Like, these guys are unlearned, they're ignorant. Like, we know they haven't had much schooling. But why, how, how is, what's going on here? How is all this taking place? And then the last part of verse 13, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, I love God's word for this very reason. I read that verse, and like a ton of bricks, it just hit me in the head. You see, what was different about Peter and John is that as they were being questioned and, and asked different things about why and how, and you better stop. They were trying to put fear into them. All they could come up away with after their talks and their uh, bullying was this. Those two guys, they've been with Jesus. There's something different about those two guys. And boy, that hit me. And I, and I shared with our Wednesday night crew. This was a couple months ago when, that, when I was reading that. I shared with our Wednesday night Bible study. And I said, the greatest desire of my heart is that on Sunday mornings I stand up on this stage. And that if you do see Mark Glenn, you would say, that guy's been with Jesus. That guy's been with Jesus. He struggles a little bit with wordings, <laughs> saying the right words. But if there's any credit I'll give him is he has spent time with Jesus. You see, that would have never become a reality to me in such a special, sweet way if I wasn't in God's Word just seeking a word of encouragement, just seeking some inspiration, 
just seeking a word, just, just, just doing what I know I want to do, hear from God. This is how I hear from God. And I'm just telling you that if you want to draw closer to God, go deeper in your time in His Word and deeper in your time in prayer. Prayer and Bible study. You can't find a substitute. There is no substitute for my prayer time and my Bible study time. How do I go closer to God? Get saved. Deeper prayer and study. Thirdly, how do I get closer to God? Confess and repent. Just confess. You see, my sin, my sin separates me, as we talked about. It puts a, a barrier between my, my relationship. My position's good, but my relationship's bad, right? And so it puts that barrier there. And, and when I confess it, it's for me to get that out of the way and say, God, my heart is clear. I don't want to keep doing that. Forgive me for that. And, and it, just, it just clears that path. I'm telling you, confession and repentance is huge in a Christian's life. It's not a one-time ordeal. Yeah, when I get saved, that's, that's, that's part of the process as I say, Lord, I, don't, I can't do it my way. My way, I do it, I, when I do it my way, I make a mess of my life. That's confession and repentance. I don't want to do it my way anymore, Lord. And then faith is saying, help me to do it your way. Help me to live life your way. And that confession and repentance part is, is emptying myself completely at Jesus' feet. Just saying, take that, Lord. And it draws me close to him. He loves a heart of humility. That's the missing piece that America has right now is humility. There's not. I don't, I don't care... You want to talk politics, you want to talk sports, you want to talk in anything in society. Humility is missing. And that is like the key ingredient to being a genuine follower of Christian is just hum humbling ourselves and saying, I'm a mess. Ah, take this, Lord, help me. I'm struggling with this. Boy, that draws me closer to God, that humility of confession. And then fourthly, I'm so excited about this. You can do this in many different ways. You want to draw closer to God, just worship Him. Just praise him. Next Sunday night, that's what I was just talking about. I am pumped about Jonathan White coming here. I'm just telling you, folks, you don't want to miss next Sunday morning or Sunday night. And, and let me just put a plug in. Bring somebody. You will, you will look like, uh, you, you will be like the number one person on their list of people they love that you invited them to come to that service or those services. He will be a special, special blessing. And here's why. The guy flat out knows how to worship the Lord, and he's really, really talented at singing. <laughs> I mean, you don't sing in the Grand Old Opry, and you don't sing with the Gathers unless you can sing. And he worships as he sings. It's to the Lord. It's for the Lord. And that brings me close to the Lord. And I'm telling you, next Sunday, you will have a sense of closeness, a, a fellowship, a koinonia, not only with your church, but with the Lord because of this man leading us in worship. Leading us in worship. That's why, that's why it's so important uh, when we have people in that they have that close walk with God because they can lead us closer to God too. Amen? Folks, I hope 1 John chapter 1, verses 1-4 through 4 has been a blessing. I'm going to ask Claudia if she will come forward and, and I would ask everybody to stand and, and just bow your heads and close your eyes. See, in a few weeks, Lord willing, if there's a need, we're going to have a baptismal service sometime this fall. And I'll just tell you this. You can't spiritually be baptized unless you're first saved. Just get saved. Just trust the Lord as your Savior. And the Bible says the first step of obedience is to go public with that. Not be ashamed of that. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And so, so God just calls us to, to, to get saved and then to let everybody know what he's done for us. We get baptized. It's a picture of what Christ has done for us. Our old life being buried, we raised when we come out of the water in new life. We're a new creature in Christ Jesus. He, he takes residence with us when we begin to have a personal relationship with us. And it's an awesome thing. And so my desire is that we would have many get baptized. Maybe you, you 
have been baptized, but you were baptized as an infant. Here at this church, at Summit Baptist Church, we believe in believer's baptism. That, that being baptized is, is, is something that, that you choose to do. After Christ saves you, it's, you choose to do that. And so, so we always encourage people who, who have been baptized in their life as a child or as an infant or as a kid, and they really didn't understand what that meant to, to consider getting baptized again. Not, we're not asking you to question your faith. We just believe that's what the Bible says. And so we want to obey God's Word. But the truth of the matter of this with, is this, with every head, bow, every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Christ. We don't think that you need to be baptized until that happens. So maybe you're here this morning and you don't. When we ask the question, do you have a personal relationship with Christ? Your answer was, I'm not sure or a resounding no. Nobody looking around. We don't like to embarrass folks, but I like to pray. And I'm going to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you're not sure or the answer is no, just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. I see that hand. Two hands. Anybody else in this service that would say, I don't know. I don't know if I'm saved. I, I'm not sure I have a personal walk with God. I, I, anybody else? As the, as the Spirit of God is working. I would challenge you this morning, if that's you, this altar is always open. You can come forward and we'll have people pray with you and, 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 and talk to you and, and, and share with you just, just how to become a, a genuine follower of Christ. And you can ask Christ into your heart today and you can ask Him to forgive you for all your junk and mess and say, Lord, help me to live my life your way now. I believe that Christ died for my sins and I want to walk with Him. If that's you this morning and God is stirring in your heart, just come forward and somebody will pray with you. If you would rather just call me and talk to me later, we can do that. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, I, I, I feel the distance. There's distance between me and God, Mark. There's distance. And just pray for me. God's laid it on my heart that I want to draw nearer to Him. If that's you this morning and God just spoke to your heart, just, just slip up your hand. Say, I, just pray for me, Mark. I see that hand. I see that hand, many hands. Let's pray and then we'll sing this song as our song of invitation. Father, we thank you for this morning and, and the power of your word. Lord, as hands were raised for salvation, I pray that you would continue to work right at this moment. That, that folks would come to this altar and just humble themselves or seek, seek a leader out and humble themselves and, and get saved and, and repent of their sins and turn to you in faith. Lord, I pray for those that slipped up their hands. There were many that, that felt the gap, a big gap between you and them. And they know that they're saved, but they, they want to be closer to you. They want to experience a closer fellowship with you. I pray that, that, that you would stir in their hearts a desire to, to confess and repent and to go deeper and to, to be more faithful to your word and faithful in prayer. And, and Lord, that you would just manifest yourself to them. Lord, we thank you for this service and all that you're doing in our church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's open our songbooks and in closing, if the Lord's, Lord's speaking to your heart, just come forward and someone will pray with you in the garden. Let's sing verse 1. I come to the